for all of the people who say government can never do anything right. The New York City watershed is a testimony to the fact that civic, un civic people can be farsighted. They can turn away from compromise and from doing things on the cheap. Um, the, we have the world's best urban drinking water. Um, Ed Koch is the champagne of drinking waters. Because of the leadership of people like everyone who's in the room, because New York City has had at critical times a civic community that has said, this is a treasure and we're not giving it up. And I hope that you will join that long and historic band as Linda has, as Eric has, as Deborah has. Um, I take a great pride in the contribution I have made to this tradition. This tradition is once again at stake and because it's at stake, it has drawn us into a statewide battle Eric is right, this is not only the most contentious battle in many years, this is probably the most important environmental issue in the history of the state because it will determine not only the energy policy of the state, but the long-term shape of the New York State landscape and whether or not most of upstate ultimately becomes a, a worn over industrial landscape that will remind us mostly of Appalachia. There's a lot at stake here. My job is to deal with all the arguments that are made for gas fracking, and, and some of you probably have seen them on the Olympics. It's wonderful, it's cheap, it's clean, it's America's hope for the future. Um, I'm gonna put them in a little more systematic order and try and go down them as quickly as I can. The first thing we get is that it's really not a threat to water quality. Um, now, to prove this, the industry sets up a Trojan horse. The Trojan horse is that gas fracking is two miles below the surface of the earth. All of the aquifers we rely on are shallow drinking water. Therefore, this stuff can never migrate through the shale and your drinking water is safe. Well, unfortunately, that's absolutely not true. It is true that so far, after about five years of gas fracking, there are no documented instances of things going from the bottom to the top. They haven't had to. The well casings that have been drilled have been so bad that before we got to the bottom, we had pollution. And before we captured the pollution at the bottom, it came up through the well casing and impacted the top. Moreover, you heard what Eric said about all the fractured shale. Shale is not some impervious layer as is suggested in those nice little cartoons the industry shows. Shale is full of fissures, fractures, microscopic pores. Water moves through shale. 30 years from now, people will be saying a much different story about how pollution migrated through the capillary action we all learned about in high school physics from the bottom up to the top. So, all of these fracking materials can get into our surface drinking water in the following ways. They can be spilled. They can erupt from the bottom. They have to be disposed of, as you heard Eric said, and there's no good way to do it. So meanwhile, the industry does things like claim this is a de-icer, and it spreads it across roads, and that flows into water streams. There can be accidents of other kinds as well. Um, floods of the kind we had this summer can damage the lagoons that store this material. In short, there's a whole series of pathways that this fracking material can get into surface drinking water. Now, the industry likes to say, in answer to this, that, well, you know, fracking fluid is 99.5% water. I mean, it's practically safe. And what but they do not tell you is that the other 5%, or one part in 200, has toxicities expressed in the parts per million. So that fracking fluid is actually poison. Anyone who drank it would almost certainly die. Um, so that this, again, this kind of false picture of the safety of this material could not be more misleading. This stuff has an enormous set of problems with it. Not only that, it doesn't biodegrade. Most of the 336 things we used in fracking fluids were designed not to biodegrade. All of these synthetic chemicals work by not biodegrading. They will either go into the water column, they will go into the mud and the sediment as the PCBs did in the Hudson. 
but we will not get rid of them. You heard Eric say very accurately that the average sewage treatment plant, in fact, virtually any sewage treatment plant, can't handle this stuff. The reason is very simple. Sewage treatment plants are just concentrations of bacteria eating bugs. Bacteria is just like you. They do not like to eat chemicals. They die when they eat chemicals. The technical term is you fry the process. Um, if you are actually going to build a sewage treatment plant to treat this stuff, and I'm very skeptical that you could build a plant that for 336 different chemicals, you could come up with a treatment train that would catch all of them. Um, it's just not going to happen. If, you, we, if we talk about pollution prevention, then the idea that we would spread this pollution through the environment, the idea that a process that uses hundreds of li listed toxics is not a threat to water is quite frankly ridiculous. But there are other th things the industry says. So let's move on to the fact that not only is, this, is fracking supposedly not the threat to our water, it is going to give us clean energy. Natural gas is clean energy. Now, your grandfather's natural gas, as we like to say, was just that. You heard Eric describe how we captured it. This was actually a very nice fuel compared to coal or um, oil. And at the point of burning, natural gas is better. But unfortunately, before we get to the point of burning, a lot of things happen. You heard Eric describe the enormous amounts of truck trips. You, there's an enormous amount of ancillary pollution, or what we call net carbon accounting, that goes with shale gas that, natural, that the old-fashioned natural gas didn't have. It's hard for some of us in the, to debate this issue sometime, because we have a tendency to talk about all natural gas, because part of the reason is the old natural gas was relatively good, and the industry is trying to hide behind that old reputation. That is, instead of talking about shale gas as a separate thing, they are hiding behind clean burning natural gas of the kind that we burned in my house when I grew up. Now, so if we start adding up the truck traffic, the cost of processing, the power used to run the pipelines and the compressors, we then get to the ultimate you know, knife in the back of the environment, which is the methane. That is, natural gas is methane. A lot of methane leaks from the shale gas process. It leaks out of the wells. It leaks out of the pipelines. It leaks from uncontrolled emissions. Methane is, depending on who you talk to, 12 to 25 times as potent a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide. So that there are many people who are now argue that actually shale gas is actually worse than oil. It is actually worse than coal once you do the net carbon accounting. But whether or not you believe that, the important fact is basically this is not a clean fuel. Shale gas is right up there with coal and oil in terms of what it is doing to our planet's atmosphere and all the consequences. Now, we're then told that this is not only clean, but it is abundantly clean. We finally have the clean fuel of our dreams. There's only one problem with this abundance. The abundance, again, is industry hype. And it's a hype not only designed to impress you, it is a hype designed to impress industry investors. The truth of the matter is, that, and it's the only good thing the industry's ever said, even though they didn't intend to, is when the industry talks about, we're gonna drill 80,000 wells in the Marcellus and 120,000 in Pennsylvania, they couldn't do that on a bet. <coughs> They don't have the money, they don't have the technical capabilities, they do not have the people. So that essentially what we're being asked for to do is to subsidize with our water and our landscapes what is essentially an industry play in booking resources. And the industry books resources because that's how they create corporate value. But you're not going to get a lot of that value. That is, the industry is actually losing money on a cash flow basis with respect to shale gas fracking. Indeed, there's at least one company in New York, Norse, that has now decided to pull out of the business. Many other people are looking for what they feel will be more, shall we say, friendly, 
um, regulatory regimes because they cannot afford to comply with a proper regulatory s scheme with respect to natural gas. They don't have the money. Natural gas is stuck at $3 every day I look at the stock market and I look at the price in TCS for natural gas and I go, okay, I'm going to wonder how much longer this Enron type dance is going to go on. But it is an Enron type dance. It is not a fuel for your future or for mine. Now, then we get to another favorite one of the industry, which is jobs. Well, I think Eric pretty much harpooned this, but I always like to say it will be very good for jobs if you like running hotels that rent by the hour. That, <coughs> that is, if you look at what happened in the Intermountain West, you've had new jails, drug addiction, crimes of violence, prostitution. Um, this is not surprising. Basically, an all-male population in its 20s is working incredible amounts of overtime in the hopes of you know, making a stash and going back to Texas and Oklahoma, create, generates an enormous amount of pressure, an enormous amount of health issues. This is not a stable long-term industry. Whatever jobs are purchased are purchased by the localities that do them at a very high price. Industry talks about how this will give money for infrastructure, the first infrastructure they built in Sheridan, Wyoming, was two new jails. Um, the, but we're also told that it's going to be the key to economic growth. And some of us fear that Governor Cuomo sometimes has been talking to too many people who have, um, in the vernacular of the street, drunk this Kool-Aid. Um, economic growth, though, does not count into effect all the loss in property value of the landowners who do not lease for shale gas fracking does not count into the fact that once shale gas fracking moves into an area, it renders it useless for activities like ecotourism or retirement homes. It does not mention the fact that farmers in areas from shale gas fracking now are having enormous difficulty marketing their products. It does not mention the fact that our state has its wineries right sitting on the top of shale gas fracking. And I, can t I, I don't think any of those vineyards are planning to put a derrick as the new sign you know, of their tang tangy new grape vintage. Um, if you net out the cost to the landscape of shale gas fracking, and there are very competent studies that have done this not only for shale gas fracking, but for virtually every other extractive industry, it's a net loss of economic growth. And this is before we get to the two other critical economic issues here. Who pays for the infrastructure? The industry has said very explicitly, we will not pay for the damage we do to local roads. Um, they've also said we will not pay a severance tax um, after they tell us how, you know, how much of, you know, property and wealth they are bringing to these local areas. They said, well, of course, we can't afford to pay a severance tax. The other thing that we have to talk about is what's going to happen economically when the industry pulls out. Every mining industry in the past has washed over the northeastern environment, has left a long legacy of superfund sites, you know, leaking dams, acid runoff from closed mines. Um, this is, again, an enormous cost that we in the state of New York will pay. And quite frankly, we in the city of New York should be very concerned about this because we provide the rest of the state of New York somewhere between five and eight billion dollars a year in tax payment transfers. And we do not begrudge this most of the time, um, but we would like to see it used, you know, used for a good purpose rather than clean up the mess. Um, now, when all of these arguments fail to convince, um, the people who've had to live with it, the people who've looked into it, they then get more atavistic. They talk about how this is a domestic fuel, free from the interference of evil foreign fossil fuel manipulators. Um, pictures of Hugo Chavez, you know, pictures of our friends in Iran begin to you know, flicker over the screen. Um, we will have energy independence, oh, yes. 
Um, why we would want it um, is a separate question, but assuming we did, there is something called energy conservation. Um, then we get to the fact that <clears throat> Then we get to the fact that we are now told that this is 100 years of fuel. Now, this is really interesting because two years ago when I got pulled into this um, issue by some consumer allegation, we only want you to look a little bit at the watershed. Um, the actual gas industry was saying this will be a transition fuel to a new era of green energy. Well, that argument has somewhat disappeared. Now we're being promised, as they say, more kind of atavistic, you know, lots of fossil fuel from America. Um, well, you can take that for what you want. Um, the, hopefully, he will not want to do it once. We then get an issue, um, and I've got two more points. The first point is, we're told this has been studied enough. The New York Post tried to tell me I was hysterical because I didn't think four years of studying this issue was enough. Um, actually, if we study it the wrong way, 40 years will not be enough. But, <clears throat> um, and Eric is right. We, have, we need to be grateful because the citizen pressure that has been put on people, even before Patterson left, he was reconsidering um, some of his initial things. And the, we did get the New York City watershed taken out. We did get state forest lands taken out. out. We got something that has not had enough attention paid to do is very generous buffers of streams. Not generous buffers, as you heard Eric say, of our own infrastructure, but the stream buffers are the best in the nation in the proposed DIS results. It's a start. It's a sign that we can get this job done the right way. But here's what is missing from the DIS. Here, besides all the costs you will pay that are not accounted for, all the social effects, Here's what is missing. The first is that there should be more lands put off, just taken out of the fracking mix than have been taken out so far. For example, the Cooperstown watershed. I, for one, would not like to drive up to see the Hall of Fame through a long line of gas drilling derricks, not to mention the Farmer's Museum and everything else we could talk about there. Um, Another thing, as you heard Eric, and I'll keep going back to it, they got no place to put the wastewater here. Um, and until they get a place to put the wastewater, they should not be permitting a single well. The, the landowners. The landowners are taking it in the neck in these deals. Unless you're somebody who wants to sell out and retire to Florida, even if you're a landowner that sells for fracking, you're going to be in a very bad way, and this is going to become a much more important issue in the next several months. But if you don't want to sell for fracking, and if you're adjacent, the stories are really heartrending and often tragic. And we who have, we in New York who believe in this kind of concern should not forget that we are talking about people. I was once in the governor's office under Patterson, and the gas, the gas industry was telling me, well, these are just anecdotes. I mean, so the question is, how many miserable people uh, take something from being an anecdote to a real problem? Um, local impacts, huge. The roads, the landscapes, the jails, the infrastructure, the teaching, the lack of housing. There's no system for local impact fees, as Comptroller Dinopoli has opposed. Um, the the ability of local areas through their zoning to control this is very unclear and needs to be clarified. And all these costs need to be laid out in the environmental impact statement. And even the state is having trouble getting its arms around these. Enforcement. When all is said and done, even if we could drive the world's best regulations on paper, if we are unprepared to enforce them, they are meaningless. When we did the... When we did the New York City Watershed Protection Program, your water and sewer rates paid for 500 new people. They paid for water quality monitors. They paid for planners. They paid for inspectors. They paid for lawyers. Um, they paid for enforcement people. They paid for cooperative programs with farmers. They paid for buying land. That's the level of investment 
that if you want to do something that is this transformative as shale gas fracking, you have to be prepared to do. Instead, under fiscal pressures, the state of New York has been gutting the Department of um, Environmental Conservation. It is stated that they will provide staff for proper enforcement. Staff for proper enforcement in all likelihood means, Mr. Goldstein, at least one staff person for every 10 wells. And it includes the capability to have on site an independent inspector while concrete is being poured and well casings are being drilled. No responsible civic engineer in the private sector would pour concrete without having that kind of quality control backing up the work. So the enforcement issue um, to which the industry says, you want to stifle us through overregulation, um, the enforcement issue is really critical. Lastly, I want to close with what the industry regards as its ultimate trump card. There's no alternative. You have to use this gas. Now, this means essentially that there is no viable conservation, no viable green energy option. Now, because I've overrun my time, I want to just say that that is actually completely ridiculous. Why do I say that? In 1940, when the United States began to face up to the inevitability of going into World War II, we had the 19th largest army in the world. We were behind Bulgaria, but we were ahead of Portugal. The <clears throat> At that time, we had 10% unemployed, 10% underemployed, and we're only using 75% of our industrial capacity. Five years later, we had a 12 million person military with so much equipment that the Germans were not even keeping st statistics on it because it was too depressing. And the investment in that military fueled 20 years of post-war prosperity. We can do the same with green energy. And we should be asking, And we should be asking ourselves, if we as a society are prepared to sink billions, in fact, the number comes close in the Western Hemisphere to $1 trillion in things like shale gas and tar sands oil and deep sea over drilling, is there not a way to take that trillion dollars and put it into green energy instead? Is, and let me, and, is there not, we might want to ask to say, just in energy conservation alone? Kind of the ultimate insult in this debate is when people go around saying, well, you're going to sh you want to shut down Indian Point, don't you, kid? Well, where are you going to get the power if you shut down Indian Point? Well, where are you going to get the power if we Indian Point blows? But that's a whole separate question. <laughs> um, the, the truth of the matter is, we have an off-the-shelf capacity to save 30% of the energy we use right now. The problem is not technical. The problem is not even economic. <clears throat> the natural gas industry likes to say, our power is cheaper. Well, of course it's cheaper. The subsidy level of black energy to green energy is five to one. We, have five, we put $5 into subsidizing black energy, which makes Exxon the most profitable corporation in the world. Um, to what we put into green energy. This is a question of economics, it is a question of institutions, it is a question of leadership. Applause for Linda, please. It is a question. <clears throat> it is a question of our will as a society. So, we don't need shale gas, we certainly don't need the consequences. Um, we can live in a lot nicer state and drink a lot better water and be a lot healthier and a lot more profitable if we look to the future and, and to remember that what shale gas in, in ultimately is doing, it is looking to a past, a past that no longer serves us very well. Thank you.